Hi, I'm Em from Broadway Best Friend, and today I'm nitpicking things that bugged me about the Wicked movie. I absolutely loved the Wicked movie. I've seen it twice so far, and I definitely plan on seeing it a third time the week of Thanksgiving. I thought it was an incredible adaptation, and I moved it into my top 10 best picture predictions for the Oscars this season. Despite me absolutely loving the film, these are little nitpicks I have of things that could have been improved upon, despite it being an amazing film. This video is going to contain spoilers for the Wicked film. First, I'm going to start with Michelle Yeoh. She played Madame Morrible, and when I think of Madame Morrible, I think of all those times I have sat in the theater to see Wicked, whether it be on Broadway or on tour, and you have that moment where Madame Morrible turns on Elphaba and turns on the audience, and it's such an act of cunning betrayal and sitting with that audience and that shared experience of we all just were betrayed by this character is such a unique experience a unique emotional experience with Madame Morrible and with Wicked so I definitely felt disappointed by Michelle Yeoh's portrayal of Madame Morrible specifically her calculatedness and the reveal that she was with the wizard the whole time I would have loved to have that shared audience experience in the movie theater of <gasps> She was on the wizard side. Like, yes, we knew it was coming, but I was just hoping for a little bit more cunningness, a little more calculation. I think she played it a little bit more solemn, a little more calm. Maybe that was her way of portraying that she was being calculated is because she was being so calm and so, like no facial expressions and kind of holding back that emotion i would have loved to have that moment of like gasp similar to like when we saw frozen for the first time and hans betrays anna like something similar like that that being said kiala settle was right there kiala settle who played miss coddle in the wicked film i think she would have been an amazing madame horrible and really brought that betrayal moment to life in the film but that was my first nitpick Next is the way that the ensemble numbers were shot, specifically in No One Mourns the Wicked and One Short Day, and a little bit for Dancing Through Life, but especially for No One Mourns the Wicked and One Short Day. I was a little disappointed by how the camera kept cutting away quickly from the ensemble members, because in the Broadway theater, when I'm sitting and watching those numbers, specifically No One Mourns the Wicked, One Short Day, and Dancing Through Life, I love watching the different ensemble choices. I like having a favorite ensemble member that I'm tracking through throughout and since those are the three moments in the show where the ensemble gets to shine I was disappointed that the use of the ensemble in those three numbers or the way it was filmed specifically were quick cut so I couldn't even really get a good look at the faces. I recently rewatched West Side Story the 2021 film and I always love oh spot the former newsies in the cast of West Side Story so I was trying to do that for the ensemble numbers particularly No One Mourns the Wicked in One Short Day of like oh is anybody in this cast like a Broadway person I know or maybe I saw them in a national tour but the cuts were so quick to the next stage picture or the next little ensemble grouping that I really couldn't see who was in the ensemble of this film. So that was disappointing. I definitely want to do a rewatch of In the Heights because I didn't remember that issue in In the Heights, particularly 96,000 and how the larger ensemble numbers were filmed. It was just disappointing that I couldn't find like, oh, a favorite ensemble number from this film like I tend to do when I'm watching Wicked on stage. Next, I have the final shot of Ariana and Popular. When she hits the final note we're not even seeing her full mouth and so as much as they tried to have that little moment of her climbing up the luggage so she could be on top of everything in her room the fact that the camera wasn't on her face when she hits the final note was a little dissatisfying particularly since I was so in awe of their little key change and outro of Ariana by herself in the hallway like that was my favorite part of that number really I feel like could solidify her as a supporting actress nomination this season at the Oscars but then to have that amazing standout number the new outro added for the film for the camera not to be on her in the final note i was a little bit shocked by that both times i watched the film circling back to dancing through life i'm still kind of neutral on what they chose to do with that production design specifically in the library i wouldn't say this was disappointing it was more just kind of more of a question mark for a song that's all about being lackadaisical and kind of going against the norm and doing your own thing it felt very since the ceilings are low then there was a lot of furniture in not a lot of space it felt like everything was a little constricted to me the library just felt very closing in on itself particularly when some of the other rooms felt more vast i don't necessarily have an alternative to present since in the stage musical were just in the courtyard but I thought I was gonna love dancing through life with Jonathan's big number and as much as he did great I don't necessarily think the library added to that song I guess they didn't want to have like another courtyard song since they had such a big focus in the courtyard in the beginning at Shiz but 
while the library setting worked well with the Bach and Nessa of it all in that number, it was still a question mark for me why they chose to commit to that for the whole number. I guess to show like, oh, they're all being studious and Fierro's corrupting them to go to the Ozdeth ballroom, then make the library bigger, like with more grand hallways. Okay, moving to the next nitpick. The coin scene with Madame Morrible and Elphaba kind of reminded me of Matilda, where Matilda's trying to show Miss Honey that she can lift the cup. For such a simple scene where we're trying to convey that Elphaba is able to be powerful when she's angry, and we see Madame Morrible be calculated in regard to bringing up Dr. Dilliman. As much as that's the main point of the scene, I thought that it was a little bit basic. I guess it's supposed to be basic since she's just trying to do a basic task of levitating and to show the growth of, oh, she couldn't even control levitating the coin to where we get to the, at the end of the film. But I was just a little surprised by how much it reminded me of Matilda. Next is the blackout right after I'm Not That Girl. That's the only blackout we have in the whole film and I thought it was really obvious. Oh wow, we did one blackout for this film to show time has passed with the letter for the wizard. It's not obvious how much time has passed, I would say. I don't necessarily think the blackout was necessary. I think by the way that Elphaba is dressed and the seasons changed, we could kind of gather that time has passed and I don't necessarily think time passing is necessarily relevant because we saw previously that Madame Morrible had written out urgent for the Wizard of Oz. So it doesn't really matter how much time has passed, but I was just like, oh, I wonder why he chose to do a blackout right after I'm Not That Girl into the little green balloon arriving from the wizard's invitation. The next nitpick, this goes back to production design as well, but the scenery that was chosen for the Oz Dust Ballroom, the most swankified place in town, it was slightly forgettable. It was definitely modern, but I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting it to be so blank. We had the animals playing instruments. I don't necessarily know if it looked modern or fancy. It was kind of just a blue or teal background. So that was definitely another question mark of we went all out for this film in so many areas, but the production design of the library, of the Ozdust Ballroom, left more to be desired, I feel. Next, Jeff Goldblum as the wizard, specifically the pacing of his scenes. I'm going back and forth on the pacing of Jeff Goldblum's scene, where we go from I am Oz the Great and Powerful, into Yellow Brick Road naming, into A Sentimental Man, into Madame Morrible entrance and the Grimmery. I thought that whole scene was rushed, But then again, by the time we're at the second hour of this film, I kind of liked that it was rushed because it's like, okay, we're just itching to get to Defying Gravity at this point. But also upon reflection, now that it's been a couple days since my most recent time watching it, I think it was uneven in the pacing because we spent this whole time building the story, the whole elongated sequence at the Ozdus Ballroom with Elphaba and Glinda dancing. Like so many of these sequences were really long and they were very intentional with the friendship beats, with wrinkling in the animal lore, whether that be from Elphaba's upbringing and then Dr. Dilliman's exposition of Oz and then how it's affecting Shiz at the present moment. But then the let's meet the wizard into turning history into okay so you're gonna come with us right felt like very rushed which yes that's the pacing of the musical but if we're making the whole act one stretched out to a whole film i definitely wonder could there have been more added to the script for that scene with regard to madame morrible either the wizard or jeff goldblum or alphabet asking questions instead of just running away i.e flying off the handle i don't necessarily think that's a critique it's just been on my mind that so many of these things took their time with the story building. Then from the second we meet Jeff Goldblum into the beginning of Defying Gravity, it was very quick. Which I think, since it's the climax of the film, it makes sense that it's quick. But if I'm thinking about the whole sequence of events from part one to the end of part two, in retrospect, that's a really rushed sequence. So I think the fact when all four of those characters were on screen, Madame Morrible, the wizard, Glinda, and Alphaba, it's not a lot of screen time. So I guess if you're thinking about it with building anticipation to the climax of Defying Gravity, it works. But in thinking about how the time spent on other things and in the grand scheme of the story, maybe it was a bit rushed and could have been added more. But then again, after hour two of the film, we're ready to get to Defying Gravity anyway. I was also surprised by the use of children in No One Mourns the Wicked, since there's no children in the musical. But I guess it makes sense since it's a whole community a whole town and then some of them are also munchkins i was also surprised to see the placement of the scene of madame morrible giving glinda the wand the night of the ozdust ballroom because i felt like that really interrupted the song but then 
it makes the scene of them dancing together in solidarity even more powerful but also if they're not allowed to be out and Madame Morrible is just like casually dropping in with the wand like is she not going to reprimand the students I guess she didn't care or that she was more focused on the alphabet of it all not the getting the students in trouble as much as I thought it was smart to split it up into two films and have Act 1 be the first film and Defying Gravity end the film, I think the character that was done dirty by their arc because of this choice was Fieros. Because looking back at Jonathan's portrayal of Fiero, he had strong moments, but since we didn't get to see much character progression or any type of resolution, we don't really know what he's up to besides him leaving Shiz on a horse. I think since it's more obvious what Elphaba and Glinda are going to be up to leading into Act 2, but it's not as obvious what Fiero is going to be up to at the beginning of Act 2 in the second film. I think the question mark around what's next for Fiero left me like, oh, I guess this was a little bit unfulfilling in that sense because overall it was a fulfilling film as much as we knew it was to be continued. Defying Gravity was so satisfying with how we left Elphaba and Glinda, but I wasn't satisfied with Fiero's ending. Not that there should have been any changes to the end of Act 1 because of Fiero, but again, just the nitpick that his arc is very much on a cliffhanger. And I do like that we cut to Fierro, Bach, and Nessa Rose at the end of Defying Gravity to kind of remind the audience, like, they're going to begin Act 2 in Part 2. The way that Fierro ended his arc in Act 1 was the most unsatisfying. Not that anything should have been changed from how the film ended, though. Those are my nitpicks for The Wicked Film. Again, I absolutely loved it. I do want to make a video about things I loved about The Wicked Film, but I did the nitpicking first because sometimes it's easier to nitpick than be specific about what you loved. I hope you all enjoyed watching The Wicked Film in theaters. Tell me in the comments your nitpicks about the film, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.